Jeremiah 32, 17. Our Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. 26. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah started this prophetic word and said a lot of things. And, and then in 26, then God now spoke by himself. And God said to him, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, behold, I am the Lord. Jehovah, Elohim. The God of all flesh. Is the God that answers prayers and unto him shall all flesh come. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? It's a question. One of the most beautiful things about being a Christian is that we can confidently depend on God and trust him to do for us what we are unable to do for ourselves. One of the most comforting, beautiful thing about being a Christian is that we can depend on God and the things that are too difficult for us, we can depend on God and trust God to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Because humanly speaking, you are going to come across so many things that would seem impossible. You're going to face challenges and obstacles at work, in your career, in your work, in your life, in your body. You're going to have those things that would, sometimes you will conclude that it is impossible. And some of the questions I want to ask you today, just like God is, you know, God is saying, is there anything too difficult for me? Is there anything too hard for me to do? And I want to ask you a few questions also. What is it that you have concluded that it is impossible? I think you should reflect. What is it that you, you have concluded? What are those things? Now, this is when you become very specific and you have to be yourself now and not think about me or somebody else. This is the time to consider for yourself what are the things that you have concluded impossible and God is saying to you, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? What is it that you have packed up thinking there is no longer hope? What idea, what dream, what vision? What are the things that you've packed up and you've told yourself there's no longer hope. Let's forget about this. This isn't going to work. This can't happen. God is saying I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? What are those desires that you have? And now you are counting time and counting your age and counting the dates on the calendar and you are telling yourself, this is beyond my reach. God is saying, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? What is it that God has told you and now it seems that it's no longer going to come to pass. You have waited long enough for so many years or for decades or for whatever you have waited for and it seems as though nothing is going to happen. God is saying to you, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? When we are at the end of ourselves, when everything fails, when our wisdom and intelligence capacity, when we are at the end of ourselves and we seem not to be able to find a way out, we can depend on God because he is the God of all flesh and there is nothing too difficult for him. We can depend on God who is omniscient God, who knows all things, who understands all things, and who can make all things happen. He's the omnificent God. He's the God that makes. 
And so no matter what we go through and no matter what your answers are to these things that we've asked, uh, can I talk to somebody here? Even things that you have accepted and you were dwelling with uh, and you are thinking to yourself, I'm just going to be okay like this. Uh, God is saying to you, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? Your sincere answer, you know, you, you need to ask yourself, why would God ask Jeremiah this question again after he had said by himself that there's nothing difficult for God and God is bringing it back to him to tell him, is there anything too difficult for me? Because sometimes you need to ask yourself twice. Oh yeah, during the week I'm going to preach on help my own belief. Now you need to ask yourself twice. You need to ask yourself that do you really know that nothing is too difficult for God? And you need to ask yourself a second time, do you really, really know, believe it? You see, this is, can, can I say this? You know, when we begin to walk with God, this is where you begin to put a line through knowledge and belief. Because they're not always the same. This is where you separate knowing it and believing it. Because knowing, Jeremiah knowing that Lord God, there is nothing too difficult for you, is separate from Jeremiah believing it that there is nothing difficult for him. If it's knowledge, you know so much and I know a lot. You know that God can do all things. Anybody believe that? Anybody here know that God can turn your life around in one day? Uh, yeah. God can genuinely turn your life around in one week, uh, in one year, even in one hour. We believe he's able to do all things. We know he's able to do it, but do we believe that he will do it? But I want to tell you that nothing changes God. Nothing can reduce God's power. Nothing can vitiate the capacity of God to bless and to do great things. And the devil doesn't know all things. The devil doesn't know all things. And because he doesn't know all things, the devil doesn't have the final authority over your life. The devil doesn't have a final say over your life. The devil doesn't have a final say over your experiences. The devil doesn't have a final say over what is going on in your marriage, in your finances, in your health, in your own. The devil doesn't have the final say because even the devil is limited in his knowledge. Hallelujah. One beautiful thing is God always has a perfect plan. He is working for our good. Though trials come, they only come to make us stronger. If I never had any problem, I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. The devil always makes mistakes. And so you need to understand that if God says there is nothing impossible for me, if God says that there is nothing too hard for me, you got to believe it for your brother, believe it for your sister, believe it for your own life. You got to believe it because sometimes we'll be at the end of ourselves and some things will seem closed up. We need to just shut the gate and shut the door. But God is saying, I am still able to do exceeding abundantly above what you can ever think or imagine according to the power that is at work in us. That's where I'm going. We're getting there. They're getting there. First Corinthians chapter 2, 6 to 9. Let me just go through a few scriptures. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. The wisdom of this world is absolute nothing. And it's happened over and over again. It happened over and over again. With coronavirus, it's happened. Before that, it happened. The Great Depression, it happened. F always, it will continue to happen that the people will know that our wisdom is limited. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Glory to God. The hidden wisdom of God ordained before the ages for our glory. Ordained for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew. 
the principalities and powers and kingdoms and all of that. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. We're talking about resurrection power, just follow me. Every attack of the enemy against you is a mistake. It is impossible, listen to this people of faith, it is impossible for Satan to have an upper hand over your life. Oh, you, you got to believe this. It is impossible for the devil, except I am not serving the living God. Except God doesn't love me the way he says he does. But I know he does. He loves me, hallelujah, with everlasting love. The devil cannot possibly have a final word over my life. The devil cannot possibly have a final say over my life. Can I prove that to you? You know your Bible very well and you know about Uncle Job. As bad as it was, everything that happened in the life of Job, yet Satan did not have the final say. With everything that he lost and all that happened, Satan didn't have the final say. And the Bible said that the end of Job was better than the beginning thereof. If the devil had known, we're talking about resurrection. If the devil had known, Good Friday would never have happened. If the devil had known, there wouldn't have been Good Friday. If the devil had known the guy, they would have left Jesus alone. If the devil had known what God was doing, because Jesus said, except a kind of weed, fall it to the ground. Uh, it abided alone, but if he dies. But the devil had no clue. You know, sometimes when I read the Bible, and, and, and I don't know what you see, when I read the Bible and look at how God is so plain with some stuff, that I'm thinking that that Satan guy must be very, very stupid. Genuinely stupid. Because the Bible made it very clear that this guy is going to be killed. And when he gets killed, this is what's going to happen. He's going to be raised from the dead. And he will be the firstborn among many brethren. But the guy's foolishness wouldn't allow him to stop. But you see, he had to make the mistake. And he had to be sufficiently stupid for us to enjoy this glory that God says is coming to us. Listen to this. What I'm telling you is simple. The devil doesn't have a final say over your life. That's regardless of what you're going through. Regardless of how difficult it seems. Regardless of how painful what they said in the office against you. No matter how bad it was, uh, that somebody taught you in good enough and they're going get, to get you sacked. Uh, no matter how bad it is, uh, that someone who's supposed to put a good in word in for you refused to put a good word for you. No matter how bad it seems, the devil can have a final word over your life. If they have known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Because what they didn't know was that the, cru the crucifixion was the release of the glory. Now, now you can get in this. The Bible says, in bringing many sons to glory, it is fitting that the author of their salvation be made perfect through the things that he is offered. So they didn't know that this was part of the package. Let me tell you something. The devil made a mistake when he attacked you. The devil made a mistake when he touched your daughter. The devil made a mistake when he touched your son. The devil, I want to tell you about the wisdom of God's word that the devil got it wrong. It's going to have the final say. If they had known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, as it is written, I has not seen, no hear heard. No, I've entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Am I talking about you just do like this? You are the one that loves God. The Bible says, I hasn't seen it, here, hasn't heard it. It has not entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for you. There's no better way to explain that God can do all things and God can make the devil look stupid, there's no better way to show that when God has a plan, he will bring it to pass. 
than what we talk about today. The resurrection. There's no better example. There's no better example. Acts chapter 2, 32 to 36. This Jesus, <laughs> this Jesus, God has raised up, of which we all are witnesses. This Jesus. Now, Acts chapter 2, if you know your Bible, you know that was Peter's preaching. After the power of the Holy Ghost came upon Peter and he started speaking and declaring and speaking and preaching the word you, and, and going through the history of Jesus Christ. And then he got to those places and he told them, he said, this Jesus we're preaching. This Jesus we're talking about. This Jesus that we believe in. This Jesus. God raised up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This Jesus God raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, let's move on now. We know his reason. We know his reason. We know, we know. That's why we're here. That's why the whole world is celebrating today. Let the whole world rejoice. He's alive. He is no longer where he laid. This Jesus God raised up of which we are all witnesses. And if somebody want to push it a little bit and you really want to be one of those witnesses, you have your Bible. But I'll tell you something, you can really pray God will reveal himself to you and you would say that you're a witness. By personal experience, I can say categorically that I'm a witness. That this Jesus got raised up. If I'm not a witness, I won't even be before you today. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. NLT Bible says the place of highest honor in heaven. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Wow. Resurrection power. Follow me closely now. The Bible said, now he raised Jesus up and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this on us. And that's what you see. That's what you hear. Listen carefully to this. God has made the same power that raised Jesus from the dead available for you through his Holy Spirit. So the resurrection power, we, Jesus doesn't need it again. He is reason. But you and I need the same power in our life. We, you and I need the same power in our body. In our walk with God, you and I need the same power. So that what is dead in our life can come to life. You and I need the same power in our finances. You and I need the same power in our marriage. You and I need the same power in our career. In everything we do, Jesus doesn't need the power. And so he is let loose the power. I have given you authority to tread upon snakes and scorpions. He doesn't need it no longer. He's raised him from the dead. And the same power is available. The same power. The same power, the same power, the same power, the same power. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 21. But I'm just going to read 19. It's a short message today, just 19. I'll build on this later. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Resurrection power. You have the resurrection power. I'm, I'm telling you, Jesus doesn't need it any longer. You need it. I do. And, but we have it. Glory to God. We have the resurrection power. We can bring to life the things that are dead. Hallelujah. We can create life to things that are dead. We have the resurrection power. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power for us? Toward us who believe. Those who believe the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. The exceeding greatness of his power, one translation says, for us. And if you want to know 
the dimension of the power that is towards you. The Bible says it is according. The word according is in line, in alignment of the same excess, of the same stuff. According to the working of his mighty power. All right. Which mighty power? You know, I like the Bible the way it just breaks stuff down. <laughs> so which power now? You know, now God says, and so that you know all the rest of the story, so that you will know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards you who believe. So you're thinking, what power are we talking about? What's his power? Then it says, according to the working of his mighty power. And then you're thinking, all right, it's not just power, it's mighty power, but it's not stopping there. It says, so that you know how potent the power that you have is. He says, it's that which he walked in Christ. When he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not, on this, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Wow. The power that I am, the exceeding greatness of God's power towards me, it's according to his mighty power which he walked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That's not all. And then moved him to the highest place. Seated him in the right hand of the heavenlies. And that's what, Acts, that's what Peter said. He says, therefore being exalted to the right hand, God raised him up, we're all witnesses, and exalted him to the right hand of God, the place of highest honor in heaven. The same power is towards us. And I calls it the incomparable great power for us who believe. The incomparable, nothing to compare it with. It's according to the mighty power power of God which he walked in Christ. Okay for a minute just to meditate on this. You know sometimes I look at myself I'm saying come on wake up. I don't know if you do talk to yourself. I'm asking myself wake up. Do you know the kind of power that you walk around with? The kind of power that God has made available to you? The kind of power the Bible says the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that the whole world is celebrating today, the same power is towards you. The same power is available for you. Now, that's scary. The same power is available for you and I. How can you live an ordinary life? How can you live a life of shame and disgrace? How can you live a life that is uncelebrated? How can you live a life that is not impactful? How can you live a life that is not influencing others? How can you live a life that is not affecting people and shaking things up? How can you have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that the dead couldn't hold him captive, and Satan, all the courts of hellfire couldn't stop him? The power that God wrought in Jesus, the power that walked in Jesus, raised him from the dead and moved him to the highest place. The Bible says the same power is towards you. It's towards you. This is the good news. The good news is not that Jesus was raised from the dead alone. The good news is that Jesus was raised from the dead and he made the same power available for you and for me. Hallelujah. Somebody just wave to us and say thank you Jesus. The same power. Let's begin to bring this to a close. The same power. The same power. The same power which raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us. The same power which raised Jesus from the dead is available for you. It's available for you. It's available for you. It's available for you. You can live a great life. You can live a life of praise, of honor, of thanksgiving. You can live a great life. You can live a life of blessing and abundance. You can live a great life. The power that with Jesus from the dead is available for you. You can live a great life. This power is available for everything that you do to the, those who believe. The same power is at work in us. 
Read more scriptures. Ephesians chapter 3, 20, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. The Bible could have said he was able to do exceedingly above or abundantly above or just say do above all. But it says he can do exceedingly abundantly above. The reason for that is all of this. It's just that there's no sufficient English language word to convey what the scripture is trying to say. So that's just all that. And that's why another translation says he can do, NLT says, accomplish infinitely more. I think that's it. Infinitely more. Infinitely more. You can get your brain around it. It has no ending. Praise God. That we ask. NIV says immeasurably more. But I'll go with infinitely more. Now to him is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. According to what? The power that works in us. The power of resurrection is not outside of you. It's inside of you. The resurrection power is not outside of you. It's in your spirit. The resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is a, listen, listen, let me say, the resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is not outside of you. The resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of you. He's walking from the inside of you. If you are born of the Spirit of God and you are a child of God, the resurrection power is not outside of you. He's walking from the inside of you. And that's why you are so special and you can do great and mighty things because of the power that is at work in you. It's not outside. It's not outside. So God, how would God do great things? He said he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that is, that works in us. Anybody here want to release yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit? Because this is the way that you begin to experience immeasurably more. Infinitely more, exceedingly abundantly above, more, all that you can ever ask or think. According to the power, God, help us to grasp this. God, help us. According to the power that works in us. The power works in us to do so many things. The power is at work. Are you a student? The power is at work for your education. <laughs> are you a manager the power is at work to be excellent manager are you a wife the power is at work to make you the wife that God approves are you husband the power is at work he can do exceedingly more abundantly above immeasurably infinitely more by the power of God Every time as a Christian you live according to your own strength, you are shortchanging yourself. You are. You are. You are living your high place of, 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 of capacity. Your high place of influence. You are trying to get on the floor to the level that you don't belong. Like one adage we say in my language is as if it's like you have an elephant for food, but you are still trying to hunt for ants. You already have something that is bigger, better, greater, the power of God. And it takes a lot of humility, submission to say, God, on my own, I am nothing. But with your power, I can do all things. For I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. The Bible says, We give you strength in your inner man. The resurrection power is, doesn't work from the outside of you. You're not getting this. It works from the inside of you. 
It gives you strength in your inner man. It strengthens us from the inside. Uh, and I'll finish with this. Romans chapter 8, 9 to 10. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. This is one of my favorite scriptures. <laughs> uh, this is one of the scriptures that turned my brain to, to the way it is. <laughs> you are not in the flesh. I would never engage with anybody who tells me I am in the flesh. It's not scriptural. It's not in the Bible. It's not true. It's a lie. You know, we have some Christians who are in the flesh. It's a lie. There's no statement like that. You can't be a Christian and be in the flesh. You, you see, the, the, the people say things that they don't understand and the, it's not in the Bible. Okay, but listen to this. But you can be a Christian and live as do you are in the flesh. You see, you are not in the flesh, but you live as if you are in the flesh. That's what is in the Bible. But listen to this. There's no way we're going. But you are not in the flesh. I am not in the flesh. But in the spirit. But look at the statement. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Oh. But just to prove to you that there is no double standard. Say, maybe somebody will not say, hey, maybe I'm in the flesh, I'm a Christian, but the spirit of God does not dwell in me. It doesn't happen. That's a lie. You can't be a Christian without the spirit of God dwelling in you. You can't be. The Bible says we're not born of the flesh, we're born of God. You can't be the daughter of your father and mother without you carrying their DNA. You can't be born of God and, be, and not have the spirit of God. You can't be here and there. Most times what we wrestle with and we say some Christians are not properly born again. There is nothing called properly born again. What it is is they are not. Say that you are or you are not. There is no proper born again. Proper spirit. Nothing like that. It at is born of the flesh. It's flesh. He that is born of the spirit is spirit. That's Jesus. Jesus said that to make it clear. That's not Paul. But you are not in the flesh. We're talking about resurrection power. Are you following me? This is the last scripture we're reading. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Hallelujah. If the spirit of God, he somebody says, but, but the spirit of God is not in me, but I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. He says, now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Where do people see what they teach? It's straightforward. It's straightforward. If anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to God. You can practice Christianity. You can act Christianity. You can dress Christianity. Talk Christianity. Fellowship Christianity. Go to church every day. Dress like a pope. If anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. You're not taking it out of your Bible, but we're going somewhere. Because sometimes, listen to this, we wonder how somebody can repeatedly say they're Christians for many years and they struggle. The resurrection power is not at work. They've learned religion. They're not Christians. The resurrection power is not at work. They are full of bitterness, full of malice. There are people they don't talk to. There are things over their dead body. Thank God God is still keeping them alive so that they can repent. And so many funny stuff. You know why? Because we have been taught this thing that you can stay one leg in, one leg out. You can be a Christian and be a non-believer. You can be both. No, you can't. And if you know you can't be both, if there's anything in your life that is not according to the power of God, you're going to cry out to God. I'm going to humble yourself that this is not me. Like I said last week, I'm not having this. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, it's not is and if Christ is in you. If and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. 
but the spirit is life because of righteousness. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, this is my favorite area of teaching. I can stay on this one alone and teach for the next one hour. So I need to move on and then close. But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead. I think I've said enough from all the scriptures that we've read that the spirit is for you. It's available. You have the spirit. You have the power. You have the anointing. You have the grace of God. The anointing of God is upon you. The Bible says you know all things. The Bible says he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Even though you are in this mortal body, you are no longer ordinary. There's power and life walking through the resurrection the power you know he made a case for it so that everybody wouldn't think he's talking about everybody he says no if you are christ and you have christ and you are saved and you are this then the same power that raised jesus from the dead if he dwells in you and i've shown you that is in you because the bible says the ex the greatness of his power towards us is according to his mighty power which he walked in jesus when he raised him from the dead The power is at work. The power is at work. 